Church, it's good to be with you guys this morning. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles today, if you brought them, to the book of Mark. We are uh, out of kind of some of the series we've been doing, and we're going verse by verse together through the gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 13 today. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. If, uh, if you didn't bring your Bible or... If you're having trouble seeing in the dark here, then we have the scriptures behind us and you can check those out. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Today we are looking together at a story in Mark where Jesus calls Matthew, the disciple. The Bible calls him Levi here in this story, but it's Matthew, the guy that wrote the first uh, book of the New Testament. It's one of those stories that as you read through it, Upon first glance, it doesn't seem to have a lot there. It seems pretty straightforward. Jesus calls a disciple. But the more and more that I've been looking at this thing and studying it, the more I'm realizing just how critical this story is in our walks with Jesus. And I think what makes it critical is a couple of things. One is that it really helps us get our minds and our hearts around how salvation works. There might not be a a better story in the New Testament that helps us understand how God goes about saving us. And so that's critical. And the other thing that's critical is this. And I want you to tune into this right here. This is, this is where I'm going today. This story is critical for this reason. There's a lot of us in the room. And when I say a lot of us, I think there's a lot of us that have an improper view. We have an unbiblical view of our own sinfulness. Okay? We have an improper view of our own sinfulness. And in this story, Jesus is going to say one of the hardest things he says in the entire Bible. All right? It's, he's going to say a tough thing. This is going to blow some of your minds what Jesus says today. Some of you are going to leave mad today. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. All right? Amen? He's saying it, not me. And, and here's what's, this is why it's so, so difficult. Because what he's going to say is that you... Having a proper view of your own sinfulness in a lot of ways reveals whether or not you're saved. Okay, and I don't care how long you've been going to church. You need to listen to what Jesus says today. Um, Let me just say this one more time. Many of us in this room have an improper view, an unbiblical view of our own sinfulness... And in light of that, Jesus is going to address that, and he's going to show us that we have to have a proper view of our own sinfulness in order for us to really come to him and be saved. All right, so here's the thing. Um, There are some of us in the room, there are some of us in the room, you fall into this category where you are deeply aware of your own sinfulness. All right, there's a lot of us in the room, we're deeply aware of our own sinfulness. And ultimately, that is a good thing. Okay, that's a good thing. When you're aware of your own sinfulness, you're going to see that here in a minute, that that's a good thing. But the problem is, and I kind of fall in this category a lot of times, I'm so aware of my own sinfulness. I get that at a deep level. I get how sinful I am. I get how broken I am. But a lot of times, the negative aspect of that is that it'll, it'll cause us to keep God at arm's length. It, 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 you realize how messed up you are. You realize how short you've fallen from the, from the glory of God. And so because of that, you think God doesn't want me or, or God's frustrated with me or that God can't use me. And this story really addresses that. This story really addresses that that is not how God views us. This is not how God interacts with us. And so that's, there's a big group of us that swing to one end of the spectrum that we so get our own sinfulness that a lot of times we have trouble approaching God or worshiping God or, or believing he loves us in light of that. Now there's, there's a whole other end of the spectrum that, that a, a lot of us fall into also. And by the way, this next group of people, the Bible talks about this a whole lot. And I'm only going to give two examples of this, but there's several examples of this group of people. So pay attention because you might be in it. And and this is how you view your sin in this group of people. You know you're a sinner, but at the end of the day, you just don't think you're that bad. Um, It talks about this group a lot, the Bible does. 
You know the verse that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know that verse applies to you. But when you look at your own sin, one of the first things that this group of people does, according to the scripture, is you start comparing your sin to other people's sin and you just don't think you're as bad as, as other people. And, and as a result of that, as a result of that, grace just simply isn't that amazing to you. Grace just isn't that amazing to you. And the reason that is, is because you haven't ever really realized how much you need grace. Okay, you can look at other people and you can realize how much they need grace. You can look at your husband and go, that brother needs grace. But it, it, it doesn't really dawn on you how much you needed grace. Okay, and what the script, and here's what I want you to hear. Now, again, if you're going to start getting mad, don't get mad, because th this, is, this is a warning for believers in a lot of ways. What the Bible's going to say, and what Jesus is going to say is, is that that's kind of where your heart is. That's a dangerous place for your heart to be. All right, let's read this together. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. <coughs> it says, and he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. And so he's got a big crowd here hanging out, Jesus does. And as he passed by, he saw Levi. Now, that's Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. That's a key phrase right there, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in, in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. And when the scribes of the Pharisees, now watch what happens here. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus makes one of the most difficult, hardest statements in the whole Bible. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. And so what's happening is Jesus hanging out by the seashore there. He's got a big crowd around him. He looks up. He sees a tax collector in his booth. He walks up to the tax collector, says, follow me. That's a command, by the way, in the scripture, not a request. If you want to go blow your mind in your quiet time this week, it's a command, not a request. He commands the guy. He says, follow me. Matthew gets out of the tax booth. Uh, and then there's some kind of a little pause there. In the next scene, we see that, that, uh, that Matthew, the, the hated tax collector, has gathered all his sinner buddies together, and they're having dinner with Jesus, and then some churched people roll up on the scene, and the church people are like, man, that's pretty nasty. Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners, and then Jesus looks at them and makes this statement, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, we're going to look at the first part of this story together because I, I really think it speaks to those of us who deeply get our own sinfulness, but in light of it, we keep God at arm's length or we think we got to get our act together before Jesus will love us or accept us. Look at verse 14. I'm going to address this first group together. In verse 14. It says, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Now, church, that's a powerful verse. It's a powerful verse. And the key to understanding why is found in the phrase, sitting in the tax booth. If you got a Bible or notes, underline that. That is key. Sitting in the tax booth. And understanding how that's such a big deal. You got to understand what's going on with the tax collector there. Tax collectors back in Jesus' day, the Jewish tax collectors were some of the most hated people on the planet. Okay, these guys were Jews. Now listen carefully. These guys were Jews that collected taxes from other Jews in order to give to the Roman government. And as a result of it, the people hated their guts for a couple of reasons. One is these guys were crooked. They were crooked. 
They would, they, they would always take more money than was necessary and they would keep money for themselves. And so just the injustice of it alone, people would look at these tax collectors and they're like, they're, they're thieves, they're crooks, they're dishonest. And they hated them because of that and they viewed them as sinners because of that. But on top of that, there was a, there's something deeper going on there. And that's that the, the Jewish people believed that God was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. That's what they were looking for the Messiah for. They thought the Messiah was going to come in and he was going to take the, uh, the Jews and just going to make them where they kind of ruled the, ruled the place. And so this was absolutely in contrast in their minds to the law of God. They were looking at this Jew who was taking money and, and taking it away from the, from the Jewish people and giving it to the Roman government. And in people's minds, they thought this guy is outright rejecting God's promise to Israel. And so if, if you were to come up to just about any Jew, now listen to this. If you were to come up to just about any Jew and say, all right, I want you to name the worst sinner in the neighborhood. Who's at the top of the list? They would have said the tax collector is. He's a crook. He's, he's a thief. He steals from us. He gives to the Roman government. And on top of that, he is absolutely rejecting God's promise to Israel. That guy right there, he's at the top of the list. He's the worst sinner in the neighborhood. Now, listen to this. Jesus is walking down the road. <clears throat> He's got a big crowd around him. He's cruising along. And he looks up and he sees one of these hated, crooked, nasty, God-rejecting tax collectors. And he walks up to the guy while he was in the booth and says, follow me. Looks at the guy and says, I want you. That, that right there, if you stop two seconds and think about it, that is one of the, 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 the greatest pictures of God's amazing grace you will ever see in the entire Bible. Why? Because Matthew was literally in the act. Think about that. He was in the act. He was doing the thing that he was doing the thing that would have characterized him as the worst sinner on the block. He was right smack dab in the middle of his sin. And Jesus walks right up to him and says, I want you to follow me. Yeah, that's right. That's cool when you get that. That's one of those, when that hits you, that right there, that's when you start singing. That's when your soul starts singing is when you get that. All right, that has profound implications on how we view our salvation. Here's the reason. The Bible says nothing about this guy having a crisis of conscience. The Bible says nothing about that. The, the Bible says nothing about this guy, Matthew, sitting there in the booth, feeling guilty about his sin, thinking, you know what, I need to get my life together. And so he sees Jesus, and, and Jesus is cruising along, and, and he starts yelling at Jesus, uh, Hey, Jesus, I'm, I'm feeling guilty about my sin here. Would you come forgive my sins? That is not the picture that the Bible paints. The Scripture, very, by, the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the guy was in the booth. That's in there for a reason. And right in the middle of that, Jesus calls him into the ministry. Calls him in a relationship with himself and calls him into the ministry. Now, here's the thing. If what is holding you back today from following Jesus, if what is holding you back today from serving Jesus, if what is holding you back today from worshiping Jesus is, this, is, the, is the reality that you're in some sin today, if what's holding you back from worshiping the Lord or following the Lord or serving the Lord is because you're in some tax booth and you know you're in a tax booth and you know that that tax booth, whatever it is, is not the place that God wants you to be. And, and because of that, your view of Jesus is that he is this guy standing outside the tax booth with, with his arms folded in judgment, looking at you, the filthy sinner, and saying, hey, buddy, you need to get your act together before you can follow me. I want you to know that that is not the picture the Bible is painting here. It's not the picture the Bible is painting. 
The picture, and I'm and hang with me through this point. The picture that the Bible is painting is a picture of God in the flesh walking on the earth, pursuing us and loving us and calling us into fellowship with him and calling us to serve him right in the midst of our sin. Now, church, make no mistake. Jesus calls the guy out of the tax booth, okay? I don't want you to misunderstand me. Jesus calls the guy out of the sin. But also make no mistake, Jesus loves him. Jesus pursues him. Jesus wants him right in the middle of his sin. You do not have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he will clean you up. All right? Now, the Bible talks about another group of people. And some of y'all are going to quit saying amen on this one. <laughs> You're, God bless you guys. No, I'm, I'm, I, I, anyway, I, I struggle with it too. But here's the thing. The Bible talks about this group a lot. And our disposition is not, I've been bad so God doesn't love me. Our disposition is, well, I've been good. I've been good. I, I don't do all the bad stuff, and so I've been good, and so of course God loves me and accepts me. All right, now again, I want you to hear me carefully. Obedience is a good thing. I'm not saying it's not. Obedience is an awesome thing. There are hundreds of times in the Bible where God calls us to obedience. And so obedience is a good thing. But listen, listen carefully. The Bible gives incredibly stark warnings to obedient people. Now, did you hear what I just said? The Bible gives stark warnings to obedient people. And the warning that he gives to obedient people is this. Look, obedience is awesome, but make sure in your obedience that you realize you still need a Savior. Here's what this story teaches us today. That if you're saved today, if you're saved today, you were the tax collector. You were the tax collector. And Jesus didn't save you because he looked at you and said, you know what? This person right here is living pretty well. They're living pretty well. They've kind of got their act together. I think this person right here would be an asset to the kingdom. And so follow me. That's not at all the picture that the scripture paints. The scripture says that we were in the middle of our sin. Every one of us in the room were in the middle of our sin and the wrath of God was coming our way until Jesus pursued you and he called you out of it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Romans chapter 5. Don't turn there. Just write it down if you want to. Romans 5, 8. We'll just, just talk about this for a second here. It says, but God shows us, in Romans 5, 8, it says, for God shows us his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, that means we're saved by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Here's what the scripture just said, and it applies to every single solitary one of us in this room who is in Christ Jesus today, who is saved. Before Jesus stepped into the picture, you were a sinner, you were an enemy. Of God and the wrath of God was coming your way. That's what it says about every one of us. And then in Ephesians 2 1, it just Paul makes sure we know that the Bible's talking about all of us. Because a lot of times we hear that and we go, yeah, that applies to that guy and that applies to that guy. I'm not sure it applies to me, but it applies to the other guy. Ephesians 2, 1, watch this. It says, and you were dead in, 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 in your trespasses and sins. That dead word means dead. Not like you were not doing well. <laughs> dead. You ever seen a dead person come to life? Once. I've never seen it other than that. You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now 
at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And so you know what a lot of us do is we read that verse, verse 3 there, and, and it, says, we, it says we once lived in the passions of our flesh. That sounds so dirty. The passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. Ooh, that's dirty too. And the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That sounds so harsh. And the tendency is for some of us in the room, I know how you're wired, you think, well, I never lived in the passions of my flesh. I was never carrying out the desires of my mind. I've been a Christian my whole life. I've never been a child of wrath. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, excuse me, and the mind, and by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, you're dead. You're dead in your trespasses, in your sins. There is no life in you. There's no spiritual life. There's no crisis of conscience. You are dead in your trespasses, in your sins. You are by your very nature a child of wrath, but God. Two of the best words in the Bible, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead... In our trespasses, he, who did? God, but God made us, who did? He made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. That word grace means the unmerited gift of God. Amen? One of the scariest things I ever hear people say when I hear it, I cringe. They'll start their testimony by saying, I wasn't into all that bad stuff. I was a good kid, and I accepted Christ at whatever age. And, and I understand where they're coming from. I get, I get what they're saying. But you got to be really, really caref careful with that right there. Because when you were growing up, you may not have gotten drunk. You may not have slept with your boyfriend. You may never have done drugs. You may never have stole your dad's car. You are not a good kid. You are not a good kid. If you think you're a good kid, you're comparing yourself to other people, and the, Jesus is about to blow that out of the water. You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, and you were carrying out the desires of your flesh and the desires of your mind living according to the course of this world, and you were by your very nature a child of wrath, but God. But God, being rich in mercy, made you alive together with him, with Christ Jesus, and it is by grace you have been saved. And the reason that it's so critical, listen, the reason it's so critical that you deeply get there that you deeply understand it is this reason, because listen, this is crazy. What Jesus is about to say is literally this. Jesus is about to say, I don't save people who sit around thinking how good they are. I save people that deeply understand how bad they are. That's what Jesus is about to say. Look at uh, verse 14. Mark 2, 14. And he passed by and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, <coughs> follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them and they were following him. So imagine the scene. Matthew, the big, nasty, heinous sinner, just got called by Jesus out of the tax booth. Matthew um, gets a little party together with a group of people that the Bible describes as tax collectors, which we just determined are some pretty bad folks, and sinners. That's all the Bible says. We don't know who the sinners were. Prostitutes, maybe? I don't know. Drunks? I don't know. Adulterers? I don't know. Sinners. It's just the Bible says sinners. Look at verse 16. By the way, Jesus is hanging out with them. He's eating dinner with them. 
In verse 16 it says, when the scribes and the Pharisees, those are the church folks, those are the righteous folks, those are the folks following the law. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? The church folks roll up and you know what, they, you know what happened? They were appalled. They, they, they were appalled by, the, by the, the group of people in the room. Y'all know what it's like to be appalled by sinners, don't you? You know, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know what it's like. We all do it. We're appalled by sinners. You got that guy that you know that drink, always, all the time, drinking one too many at the party. You kind of shake your head. That guy's a drunk, man. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Girls, y'all know what I'm talking about. Got that girl you see, that other, that other woman, her shirt, her skirt, just a little too short, showing a little too much cleavage. Y'all know what y'all think about her. You got the, the, the guy or the, or the woman in, in, in y'all circle of friends that has cheated on your friend or confesses to pornography or whatever and you just think, man, the guy's a loser. Y'all you know what it's like to be appalled by sinners, right? And Jesus is saying, look, you got to be really careful with that. You got to be really careful with that because, because that says something about the condition of your heart. If that's your disposition, and I think we probably all wrestle with that, but if that's kind of the, kind of the path that we're walking in is that we're all the time looking at other people and kind of looking down at them and comparing our sin to theirs, and, and, and Jesus says that says something about your understanding of your own sinfulness. Because what's interesting about this story is that Jesus doesn't look at the church people who were appalled by the sinners and talk about their judgment. He doesn't look at them and say, hey, y'all quit judging. He, hears how, he sees how they're appalled at the sinners and he makes a statement about how salvation works. He makes a statement about, a haunting statement about how salvation works. They're appalled, they walk in, sinners, ooh, nasty. Look at Mark 2, 17. And hearing this, in verse 17, and hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus says two things about how salvation works. The first thing he says, it is not healthy people who need a physician. Sick people need a physician. Now here's what that means. Why do people go to a doctor? Why do you go to a doctor? Because you're sick. Okay, but here's the thing. Not just sick people go to doctors. But people that are sick and realize that you cannot heal yourself. That's the only reason you go to a doctor. You don't go because you're sick. You go because you're sick and you realize you need outside expert help to heal you. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, all of us are sick with sin. Every single one of us is sick with sin, but the only people who will actually come to the great physician are the ones who deeply realize they need a doctor. His point here is, is not that some people need a doctor and some people don't. That is not what he's saying. He's saying everybody needs a doctor. Everybody needs the great physician, but the only people that will come to the great physician are the ones that realize they need outside expert help to heal their sickness. That's what Jesus just said. Last thing he says is this. This is haunting. Jesus said, I did not come. To call the righteous, but sinners. Now, his point is not this. Listen carefully. His point is not that prostitutes and drunks and crooks are the only people that can get saved. His point is this, is that people that are going to get saved are the ones that deeply realize they need a Savior. That's what he's saying. By the way, that, you start realizing 
Jesus says this all through the New Testament. That's what the Beatitudes mean. The very first Beatitude, the ones were like, what does that mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what that means. There are two words in the Greek New Testament for poor. The first word means college poor. You know what I'm talking about? The first word you see in the New Testament for poor is college poor. It's like ramen noodle poor. It's, it's dig around in your couch and get some change and go to 7-Eleven poor. But what's, what's the thing with college poor? You can still look in your couch and get some change and go to 7-Eleven. You can still bum a couple of bucks off your buddy and go to Walmart and get some ramen noodles. You can still provide for yourself. The Bible uses that term, that term several times in the New Testament, but there's another term, the only other term for poor in the New Testament. It doesn't mean college poor. It means utterly destitute. And by the way, Jesus doesn't use the college poor term right here. In, in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes. It means utterly destitute, utterly incapable, utterly incapable of providing yourself. Imagine a child in a third world country who has just been abandoned, like a, not a child, but like an infant, abandoned on the side of a road uh, because it has AIDS and his parents abandon it and it's just uh, the little two month old infant with AIDS is just laying there. That's a whole nother level of poor. Y'all see what I'm saying? That's the word Jesus uses. Jesus says, here's, here's who's going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Is those who are utterly destitute in their spirit. In other words, the people that deeply, profoundly realize that they are absolutely, utterly, completely incapable of any spiritual good are the ones who will turn to Jesus to save them. We got to get there. Last thing. This is exactly what he says in Luke 18, 9. This is a crazy, I'm almost done, so hang with me. Luke 18, 9, listen to this. And by the way, this is right by the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is essentially the same point as this story, by the way. Luke 18, 9. He also told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Let me read that again. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Luke 18, 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this way, prayed thus, God, I thank you I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector right here. He steals money, completely doesn't understand the promise of God. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Watch this next verse. Verse 14, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Okay, two guys. One of the guys, first guy's looking around. This is all the good stuff I do. And God, I thank you that I don't do all the bad stuff like him and him and him. I don't do that, and I don't do that, and I don't do that. Thank you, God, that I'm not doing that, and I'm not doing that. And then there was another, another guy off to the side. He's not worried about anybody. He's not looking at other people and comparing himself to other people. This guy's on his knees. He won't even look to heaven, and he's beating his chest, and he's crying out to God, God, have mercy on me because I am a sinner. And then Jesus in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Church, what Jesus just said is one of these guys is saved and one of them is not. Jesus described a, a church attender, a guy that went to church every single Sabbath. This guy prayed. This guy tithed. This guy fasted. He was honest in his business and he was faithful to his wife and Jesus, not me. Jesus said he was not saved. 
And the reason Jesus says he was not saved is because he didn't deeply realize his own sinfulness. He didn't think he was sick and therefore he was trusting in his own righteousness and therefore treated others with contempt. It's one of the symptoms that you know that you may be trusting in your own righteousness is you're treating others with contempt because of their sin. The other guy's beating his chest saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm not worried about this guy. I want you to know God. I know that I am a sinner. And Jesus says, that guy's saved. I'm done. Listen. Church, we got to examine our hearts today. I don't care how long you've been going to church. You struggle with looking down on other people because of their sin? It might be because you don't understand how sinful you are. When you get what you've been saved from, you're not looking at other people. You're looking at God asking for mercy. Do you struggle with giving grace and forgiveness to others? It might be because you don't realize what you've been forgiven of yourself. You're looking at the good stuff that you do and the bad stuff that you don't do and comparing yourself to other people or are you on, on your knees saying, God, I need your mercy and your grace. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Last thing, for many of you, I hope this is good news for you today. You don't have to get your act together before you worship him or come to him or serve him or love him. Because this story clearly shows us that Matthew was in the middle of his sin and Jesus called his name. You step out of the tax booth today and you follow Jesus. All right, let's pray. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. If you have been keeping God at arm's length with your heads bowed, if you've been keeping God at arm's length, if you're thinking you don't qualify, guess what? You don't qualify. And he loves you anyway. You come to him. If you realize today by the Spirit you've been comparing yourself to other people, struggling with forgiveness, you ask Jesus Christ to come and, and change your heart so that you would deeply realize what you've been saved from. Jesus, your grace is amazing. Your love is undeniable. We thank you, Jesus, that you save a people that are undeserving of your love. Your grace is truly amazing. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together. As we sing this song, we've sung it a lot over the last couple of years. Think about what you're singing. Let your soul sing this truth. He loved, he loved a people undeserving.